Good afternoon and welcome to Rediscovering the Truth. I'll be your host and teacher, Marquita Smith, and I am continuing the series with you on Ministers of a New Covenant. Today we're going to talk about law and grace. Really important topic because a lot of times we see the law or we see the grace, but we don't see that in the New Covenant the Lord actually has incorporated both and that they're essential for us to receive every promise that he has for us, his entire will for us. And so let us look back at Jeremiah chapter 31. We want to look at the New Covenant as it is spoken of in the Tanakh, and then we want to see how it plays up in the Brit Hadashah. Now, we'll see. In Jeremiah 31, looking at um, verse 31 again, reading um, where the Lord is speaking through the prophet Jeremiah about the New Covenant, it says, Here the days are coming, says Adonai, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It, it will not be like the covenant I made with their fathers on the day I took them by their hand and brought them out of the land of Egypt, because they, for their part, violated my covenant, even though I, for my part, was a husband to them, says Adonai. For this is the covenant I will make with them, with the house of Israel, after those days, says Adonai. I will put my Torah within them and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will any of them teach his fellow community member or his brother to know Adonai, for all will know me, from the least of them to the greatest, because I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. Now, this is really important revelation for us, because you'll see as we're, as we're reading this, that he still speaks of the Torah. He still speaks of the law. He says that he will put his law within us, writing it on our hearts and on our minds. So it doesn't go away. He doesn't take the law away. He doesn't stop the law. The law doesn't end. Instead, the law shifts location. It shifts from the location of the stone tablets and the scrolls of the Torah to the, the tablets of our heart, which should be hearts of flesh that are not stony toward him, that are not rebellious toward him, that are supple and humble toward him, and also to a mind that is turned toward him, that we would have life and, and, and life forevermore, because we have a mind of life, a mind of shalom and peace with God, that we are able to receive what he has for us, and that it is written on us, on our hearts and on our, on our hearts and on our minds. Now, what becomes important to note about that is that if you've noticed that before, then you may have missed the other piece, which is the grace that is written into the New Covenant. Because he continues on um, in verse 33 in the NIV, or if it, you're reading the complete Jew, Jewish, um, in the complete Jewish is verse 33, and in the NIV is verse 34. It reads, No longer will any of them teach the, his fellow community member or his brother, no Adonai, for all of them will know me from the least of them to the greatest. Now, this is where the grace comes in, the second half of this verse. All of them will know me from the least of them to the greatest, but why is it that it's possible that we know him? Because. I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. That is the grace. Grace is giving us something that we don't deserve. What we receive here in this second half of that verse is forgiveness, which we haven't earned, we don't deserve. Uh, we've not opened the door for it. because he's, he, It's very interesting because he tells us that he's making a new covenant with the house of Israel. And then, of course, I've explained this in the first teaching or ministers of a new covenant, the ministers of a new covenant, Israel, that particular teaching, we look at the fact that the nations weren't given the new covenant. The Gentiles weren't given the new covenant. The church wasn't given the new covenant. The new covenant was given to Israel because the Lord is making a new covenant with Israel. It says the days are coming when he'll make the new covenant of Israel. So it's not in the days of Jeremiah. We know, of course, Jeremiah is foreseeing the days of Mashiach, Messiah Yeshua, where that new covenant was then made in his blood, we read that in Luke chapter 22, where he said, this is, the, this is my blood of the new covenant that is poured out for you. And so we see that that time was not this time period of, of Jeremiah. It's the time to come. But in that time to come, in that time of the new covenant being written in the blood of Messiah, the Gentiles are then able to partake of it because they're grafted into Israel. So Israel is, is the, the receiver, the recipient of this new covenant. Israel, house of Israel, house of Judah. But the new covenant is opened to Gentiles who hadn't previously received the old covenant, um, but they received the new covenant now after being grafted into Israel, which you'll see in the first teaching. Now we get an understanding of the fact 
that the way this can happen, the Gentiles being grafted into Israel, is not just because this Torah is so present, but and it moves from the, the scrolls and from the stone tablet to our hearts and our minds, but it becomes possible for Gentiles and even Jews to partake of this new covenant because the Lord brings with it a grace which is the extension of forgiveness, his hand of forgiveness, his hand of mercy, his hand of fellowship, though we don't deserve it. He extends this mercy, this forgiveness, uh, this grace of forgiveness in this particular covenant, in the new covenant we get this grace of forgiveness. Now, it becomes really important to understand why this was necessary. And we can look right back at this verse for it, but we'll also look at the Brit Hadashah to see why that grace had to come, the grace of forgiveness. Because he says right here in Jeremiah 30, chapter 31, um, he says in verse 32 in NIV or verse 31 in the complete Jewish, It will not be like the covenant I made with their fathers on the day I took them by their hand and brought them out of the land of Egypt, because they, for their part, violated my covenant, even though I, for my part, was a husband to them, says Adonai. So it becomes clear that the need to even create a new covenant comes about because Israel has broken the covenant. Not because God broke the covenant or because he changed his mind, because he actually continues on after these verses in saying that the laws will not remo be removed from his presence. Um, uh, the, the laws of the sun and of the moon and of the sea and the stars in the sky will never be removed from his presence, just like the children of Israel won't be removed from his presence. So he's saying, I'm always going to have a covenant with you. I'm going to keep mine. The reason I have to make a new covenant is because you all are not able, capable of keeping the old one. Now, it's a, there's a wonderful teaching in the Brit Hadashah about the significance of this and in this, in this old covenant, new covenant. And we've been challenged, many of us, when we read it, because what we, we, we did not really understand um, how it worked. Now, Romans chapter 7 it's a wonderful chapter. I'm actually not going to re read that to you. But Romans chapter 7 is a good chapter to understand the significance of the law. In Romans chapter 7, Paul is telling us very clearly that the Torah, the law that God gave through his servant Moses, is holy. He says it in, in verse 12 of Romans chapter 7. So the Torah is holy, that is, the commandment is holy, just, and good. Torah is holy, just, and good. We need the Torah. Because he says even, even more throughout uh, Romans chapter 7 that the Torah is like a mirror that tells me what my sin is. He says, you know, I wouldn't have known um, not to covet except that the Torah says do not covet. So I needed to know that I was sinning against God. It's interesting because a lot of times we, we feel condemned when we come into the knowledge of our sins. But the truth is we were sinning before we knew we were sinning. Sin doesn't become sin once I know that it's sin. Sin is sin whether I know it or not. This is why the Tanakh is so important. When I read in the Tanakh that the children of Israel had to give sacrifices for their unintentional sins, their unknown sins, the sins of, of, of omission, you know, those things that they did not do, they didn't know they, they were supposed to do, they, they overlooked, they failed to do, the sins that they committed that they didn't even know were sins, there still has to be a sacrifice of blood for those. To understand, to, when I read that, it gives me an understanding that when I don't know what God requires, if I don't know the law, I'm still sinning. Not only am I still sinning, but the law of sin and death, which Paul speaks of here, is still applied to me because it's a universal law, just like the laws of the, of the stars and the, and the moon and the sun that we were just speaking about in Jeremiah 31. The law of sin and death is a universal law. It is one that has always existed since humanity has been in existence and, and we fell from um, grace in um, Genesis chapter 3. So it becomes very important to recognize that just because I don't know I'm sinning, doesn't mean that that law is not working against me and bringing death to me. If I'm in sin or if I'm sinning, I'm still bringing death to myself and to others, whether I know it or not. The law comes to tell me you're sinning. This is what your sin is. This is the consequence of your sin. It doesn't help me to change. And it's interesting because if we look at our natural laws, like we look at the political laws of our nation and societies and stuff like that, we recognize that the law uh, about speeding doesn't enable me to drive properly, skilledly. You know what I mean? I'm not, I'm not, it's not teaching me how to be skillful as a driver. It's not teaching me to be careful as a, uh, as a driver. It's not teaching me to be a safe driver. It's just telling me that I'm only allowed to go a certain 
limit, a speed limit on this highway or this road. And if I go past it, the consequence will be thus and so. That's all the law tells me. What I'm to do, what I'm not to do, and what the consequence is of me doing the thing I'm not supposed to do. That's what the natural laws tell us. The same thing is true with the spiritual law, the, the, the law of God, and that it tells us what not to do, what the consequences are of those laws. However, what I love about the New Covenant is that we receive the Ruach HaKadosh, the Holy Spirit, so then not only do I learn what the law says, but I am transformed by the renewing of my mind. And I'm con that's a continual process that you'll read the complete Jewish, Romans 12, or 1, that I'm continually transformed. I keep letting myself be transformed by the renewing of my mind. And that ongoing process throughout my life of letting the Holy Spirit enter and, and, and change my mind, change my heart, all those things happening to me, that continual process, you know what it does? Is it allows for me to be trained and changed that I might keep God's law. So the Spirit gives me the power to do what the law just convicted me of. See, the law told me clearly, this is what I should do, and it convicts me when I don't do that or when I do something that I ought not do. But just reading the law and knowing the law, having it outside of myself, on a scroll, on, a, on, a, on the stone tablets, even here, as I have it here in, 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 in my Bible, this is outside of myself. I can read the Bible all day long and not be changed unless I'm inviting the Spirit of the Holy God to make those words alive. Because as the Lord breathed them into the, the, the writers of the, of the scriptures, the, the Brit Hadashah and the Tanakh, they are living words, but they only become life to me when I receive the Ruach HaKadosh, that Holy Spirit, so that the Holy Spirit can change me that I might be able to keep the law. And that's where the grace comes in. He forgives the sins because he knows that he himself is changing me that I might be able to continue to move forward and sin no more. This is why when Yeshua had the woman come to him um, who had been caught in the act of adultery, she laid down before him. She, she, uh, they were about to stone her. Um, so she's before him just waiting pretty much for execution. And he says that he who is without sin cast the first stone. They all throw their stones down, the older ones first and the young ones, because the older ones knew they were jacked up. The older and older you get, the more you learn yourself and the more uh, self-reflective you become and you really realize your true condition. When you're younger, you think you're awesome. But as you get older and older, you realize, man, I, every time I start to work on something, I realize there's even more stuff I need to work on. You know, that the, 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 the aging process brings with it wisdom if you're in a relationship with the Lord. So the, the older ones, they knew. I can't, you know, condemn her because I know I've been, I've had sin in my life. Then the young ones caught a clue. He then looks at her and he says that he didn't forgive her. I mean, that he didn't condemn her. No one condemns her, neither do I condemn you. Now go and sin no more. How could he command her to sin no more? He was not speaking of every sin that ever she could commit. He was speaking of that particular sin, the sin of adultery. He had delivered her. From the death sentence that came with adultery through his grace, that forgiveness, and in his words and speaking to her, he was releasing the spirit into her to empower her not to go back to that sin and thus open up a portal of death into herself and others again later. This is key for us to receive in this new covenant. It's not about us working hard, working hard, working hard to do everything God has told us to do. It's also not about us doing whatever we want to do and just believing that, you know, God's grace is going to cover it because what that is is that's an extreme. And any extremes are of the enemy. That They are not of God. Um, Ecclesiastes teaches us this. So it becomes very important to find this narrow path, not that broad road that leads to destruction. We need the narrow path here, the narrow path where we've got the law, uh, of God in one place, and we got the grace of Messiah in another place. In that middle ground, between the grace that comes with the forgiveness of sin and the law that tells me what, what sin is, is transformation. So I found out what sin is, and I'm convicted, convicted, convicted. I'm wrong, I'm wrong, I'm wrong. I need to change. I've got to change. I need to change. I've got to change. I'm not able to change. I'm stuck. I'm a wretched person. This is what Paul says about himself. It's so interesting. He says it 
Um, in, uh, in Romans chapter 7, it says in verse 24, What a wretched man I am, is what Paul says. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Then, and in the complete Jewish, it says bound for death. On the other side of this spectrum, I have forgiveness. Yes, you have sinned, but I forgive you. I graciously offer unto you a forgiveness that you do not earn and do not deserve. But I'm giving it to you because I love you. That's on this side. In the middle is me. In the new covenant. Allowing God to teach me what he doesn't like. Forgive me for messing it up. Teach me what he doesn't like. Forgive me for messing it up. Teach me what he doesn't like. Forgive me for messing it up. And eventually I get to a place where I'm walking straighter and straighter and straighter. Not vacillating as wildly as I did before. Because that really happens at the beginning of our walk. We learn what's wrong, we get forgiven. We learn what's wrong, we get forgiven. We learn what's wrong, we get forgiven. But we should be coming to this middle place where we're a little steadier. We still, you know, make some changes and cha- I mean, some challenges. We hit some challenges and, and we veer off just a little. But we shouldn't be as wildly moving across the spectrum as that before because we do have the spirit that transforms us in areas. So the, the, the challenge to us in the new covenant is not to sin in the same way after God has delivered us because that grace is for a new sin or sin that I have just realized is a sin. It's not for me to continue in a lifestyle that the Lord has already made clear to me through the Torah, the law that is written on my heart and on my mind, is not for me. Now, that law that's written on my heart and my mind is actually has even more than 613 mitzvahs. Way more than 613 laws is written on my heart and on my mind. Those include specific instructions for me, not just instructions for the global body of Messiah or for God's people all over the world. Like he may tell me something. That is just for me. That is a law unto me. That is a law unto me. If I know what God's will is for myself and I do the opposite of it, I've broken his law that was written on my heart and written on my mind. I've, 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 I'm trespassing against this new covenant that was bought for by the blood of Messiah. So I've got to stay within the bounds of this new covenant. That as God ministers to me and reveals to me this is sin, that I say, okay, Lord, I don't want to do that anymore. He forgives me. He cleanses me of it. His Ruach HaKadosh comes in and teaches me, transforms me in that area. And as I grow in that area, I sin less and less and less until I sin. I don't sin anymore in that area. Like I may stop um, sinning in a lifestyle of sin in that area first. I might straighten up my life. I don't live, you know, the way I used to live. I don't speak maybe the way I used to speak. Then I might change uh, the people I'm around who, you know, maybe used to lead me into that life. Then I might change my thoughts about it so that I'm not even thinking about those things anymore and so it, it's a it's a growth process in being cleansed of that sin but now he's going to move on to another sin he's going to say now I'm going to deal with this one he's like, oh lord I, sh- I just stopped doing this I thought I was holy I thought I had arrived at holiness but no there is no arrival at holiness until we're in glory with him forever until that day he will keep revealing to us sins that that convict us we're convicted of those sins and then we're forgiven of them that will continue to happen. But, bless the Lord for the Ruach HaKadosh. I want to read this um, to you in Romans chapter 8. You should actually read the whole chapter. It's really awesome. But Romans chapter 8 is one of my first, my my, um, my favorite chapters. It was the chapter that I preached my initial sermon on. I actually preached the whole chapter, um, which is the way I minister. As you can tell by these long uh, teachings I do on Rediscovering the Truth, as opposed to the short sermonettes that people are able to to. to to get out off of just a few verses, the Lord gives me chunks of scripture um, when I minister, when I teach. Uh, I just bless the Lord that I've been able to bring Rediscovering the Truth down to 30 minutes. I know that's been his grace upon me um, because his teachings he gives me are usually long. But this one, I'm not going to give you all Romans 8 today. But let's start with verse 1, reading from the complete Jewish. It says, Therefore there is no longer any condemnation awaiting those who are in union with the Messiah, Yeshua. Now, it doesn't mean we're going to become perfect, but we're not condemned. Conviction and condemnation are different. The law convicts me. It tells me you are wrong, you are guilty, you have sinned. That's not what you're supposed to do. Condemnation is you are sentenced to death. I'm no longer sentenced to death. Convicted, yes, because I still have the law. Where is it? It's in my heart, it's in my mind. I am convicted. Without 
the law, there is no conviction. Without the law, there's no conviction. So we cannot have a new covenant without the law. We have to have the law because what is the Holy Spirit coming to convict me of if there's no law? There is a law. And it's not the law of my own mind. It's not the law of my own ministry or, or denomination or group or religious order. It's not that law. It's the law of the Bible. It's the law of God. It's the law of Moses. It's the Torah. Same law has not changed. That conviction of the law then it's going to lead me into godly sorrow, which will, which will help me to repent. Because I'm sorrowful for hurting the Lord the way I have. Now, the condemnation doesn't come because now I'm not giving over to death. Instead, I run right up into forgiveness, smacks me in the face. And I'm excited about the fact that we have a new covenant in the blood of Messiah Yeshua so that the death that I deserve for my sin, I don't have to receive. I don't have to die. The blood covers it. Um, it has paid for it. Yeshua actually pled guilty in the court of heavens on my behalf for that sin already. And he paid the price, which means I have to be released. I have to be free. However, let me not return unto sin. Because anyone who continues sinning has not, have not, has not even known him nor seen him. This is what John says about, uh, I think it's in First John, about us um, continuing on in a lifestyle of sin once the Lord has delivered us from it. He has convicted us of it. He's forgiven us for it. He's delivered us of it, but we continue on because we choose to. That is a misappropriation of grace. It's a misuse of grace. Um, it's like spitting in the face of the Lord, and it's breaking of the new covenant. Because the new covenant is that I would be convicted by the law, forgiven of the sin, but that I could find that narrow path to life that is laid out for me. Not that I would continue on the wide path of destruction, bouncing back between the law and forgiveness, back, 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 back and forth, back, forth, back and forth, because I'm doing whatever I want to do. Instead, I'm on a narrow path where being convicted and forgiven leads me to this wonderful place of finding God's will for me personally, which is going to line up with all of Scripture. Verse 2. Um, why, Paul says, is there no condemnation for those in Messiah Yeshua? Because the Torah of the Spirit, which produces this life in union with Messiah Yeshua, has set me free from the Torah of sin and death, which is that there's a law of sin and death, meaning I sin, I'm supposed to die. Plain and simple. And the Torah brings that to me very clearly. That's what Romans 7 talks all about. The verse 3, for what the Torah could not do by itself, because it lacked the power to make the old nature cooperate. That's going to be my sin nature, my flesh, my will, which is driven by my soul and its wounds and its will. All of that working together against my spirit. So, for what the Torah could not do by itself, because it lacked the power to make the old nature cooperate, God did by sending his own son as a human being with a nature like our own sinful one, but without sin, God did this in order to deal with sin, and in so doing, he executed the punishment against sin in human nature. Not just in me, myself, but in human nature. Verse 4, so that the just requirements of the Torah, the just requirements, we always, God, that's not fair. The fact that it's a just requirement, it is just that my blood will be demanded of me for sin. That is just. It is fair. It is the penalty that has been decided beforehand that I took upon myself when I decided to sin. And that's what that means. Romans chapter 8 verse 4. So the just requirement of the Torah that I would die for my sin might be fulfilled in us who do not run our lives according to what our own nature wants but according to the Spirit. Verse 5. For those who identify with their old nature set their minds on the things of the old nature. So remember I told you, there's got to be a time where our minds start to change. I may change the lifestyle, behaviors. I might change who I associate with, but my mind even has to change about that thing. Um, for those who identify with their old nature set their minds on the things of the old nature. But those who identify with the spirit set their minds on the things of the spirit. Having one's mind controlled by the old nature is death. So you could believe you're in the old in, in the new covenant and still be headed toward death. Not because God hasn't forgiven your sin, but because your mind is still trying to do whatever it is you want to do, and you are taking the forgiveness, that grace, for granted. Mind still leading you toward death because you haven't been washed by the word of God. You're, you're not being transformed by the renewing of your mind because the fact that I'm convicted of sin and then forgiven for that sin should cause me to love him. You sure said this of the of the of the uh, woman of ill repute who came and 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 she was uh, 
crying over his feet and she uh, wiped that off of her hair. Um, this woman was spoken poorly of the, of the Pharisee in whose house they, they were having this uh, meal. And Yeshua said, her many sins have been forgiven, so she loved much. But he who is forgiven little, loves little. So we see very clearly from that example and from that scripture that forgiveness leads us to love. That's the middle path. Love is the middle path. I'm convicted of sin, and I know I'm supposed to die. See, I have to, re I have to accept that it's a just requirement. I'm supposed to die. My blood is, is required of me for my sin. I'm forgiven of that. So I realize, whew, I'm not going to die? What? You're going to let me live? You're giving me forgiveness? So not only do I get the mercy that I'm not going to die, but I get the grace of the forgiveness that it's completely expunged and wiped from my record. What? I'm going to love you for the rest of my life, and I'm going to serve you. This is the attitude we're supposed to have because we've been forgiven much. So we should love much, which should bring us right to the middle road, not back to sinning again so that we're convicted again and go back to forgiveness, sinning again. and convict. We're like repeat offenders when we do that, and judges hate that. If you're a judge in the courtroom and you keep seeing this same young person, 20 years old, 21 years old, 22 years old, 23 years old, you saw them when they were 15 in juvenile court, you see them keep coming back to you for the same crime, same crime, same crime, though you had committed to be gracious to them, you had committed to probation and, and community service and mentors and all of this, you've seen them eight times, dude, you're going to jail now. Because you apparently aren't learning. Your mind has not been changed about this sin. You're going to jail. So we actually remove ourselves from the new covenant by taking grace for granted. That forgiveness, that grace for granted. We remove ourselves from that new covenant. And we get upon ourselves the righteous requirements of the Torah, which is death. Because our minds have not been changed to be spiritual. They're carnal and still thinking about what their old nature desires. That's the trap of condemnation. It's a trap because I'm not looking at what the spirit requires. I'm still looking at the things of the flesh. Even if I try not to sin in my own strength, it's still the trap of condemnation. So I'm not looking at the forgiveness, the high cost that was paid for the forgiveness, and then loving God as a result of it and allowing that love to lead me into the right place. Either way, the enemy snatches me right up out of the, old, out of the new covenant. Or really the truth is he can't really pull me out of God's graces. I walk out on my own accord. And then the enemy's right there waiting for me to take me into a place of condemnation. And that is the place where Judas found himself. Because he did not have to be condemned in this life and the next. He didn't have to. He could have continued in his salvation with fear and trembling if he'd gone back to Messiah Yeshua for the forgiveness and, and loved Yeshua for forgiving him. Can you imagine? Yeshua's headed to the cross. Judas asked for forgiveness. What would Yeshua have done? He would have forgiven him. He always forgives. He put the ear back on the servant of the guy who came to arrest him when Peter cut it off. Right in the garden. He's always forgiven. He forgave, he forgave Peter for disowning him three times, looking him dead in the face, disowning him, telling him, I'm going to die with you. He forgave everything. He would have forgiven Judas. But Judas would have gone to the cross with him. He would have taken up that suffering with him, but he would have loved the Lord for it. Matter of fact, he might not even. He might have actually been able to walk away. We don't know what, what, what could have happened. The Lord could have uh, uh, given him such a grace that he was released, and he became the leader of, of the apostles as opposed to it being Peter because he loved the Lord so much for forgiving him. Because on his way to the cross, Yeshua would have forgiven Judas because it's his nature to do. He came for forgiveness. It speaks of it in, in John chapter 3, that he didn't come to condemn the world. He came to save the world. And that included Judas. But instead of going back to Yeshua for forgiveness, he went back to the Pharisees and they condemned him. They said, what does that have to do with us? This is your affair. And they and, 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 and they allowed him to walk right out with those sins without even addressing those sins because it, it was not in them the power to forgive. This is why they were so amazed that Yeshua was forgiving all these people. When he says, get up and take your mat, your sins have been forgiven. He's telling everybody this to go and sin no more. Your sins have been forgiven. Your sins have been forgiven. Your sins have been forgiven. Only God can forgive sins. Yeshua came to forgive sins through that cup of redemption that he that was poured out for us, that his blood in the new covenant. When he forgives sins, he forgives. That's what he came for. It's forgiven forever. But let us not take that for granted. And let us not forget what he's done. Let us return his forgiveness with love. And he said, if you love me, you'll obey my commandments, which is going to lead me right back to finding out what he wants from me so that I can start to line up. Get, I get convicted. I receive that forgiveness, and I love him all over again. 
this is what the new covenant is all about. It's, it, it, it does not exist without the law. It doesn't exist without Israel. And it is certainly full of grace, but not a grace to be mishandled, misused, or abused. The grace in the new covenant should send us to a place of love. And the place of love sends us right back to the commandments. Because if we love him, we'll keep our commandments. We'll keep his commandments. So I pray that that has helped you to understand how to be a minister of the new covenant. That you must have the law and the grace for yourself. And you must share and teach law and grace to others. That we might be forgiven of those sins that the law convicts us of. But more than that, according to Romans chapter 8 and so many other places in the scripture. That we would, be, we would receive the spirit. That we would be empowered to stay free in those areas. And do that which the lover of our souls would want and appreciate and love, which is to obey him because we love him. We're returning his love that he gave us in the forgiveness and the shedding of Messiah's blood. I really do hope that that blessed you. And I look forward to, to ministering to you again and talking with you uh, next week about being ministers of a new covenant because this is a, a responsibility and a wonderful call that the Lord has given us. Be blessed this week.